Now you've been involved in the development of your own future studies, but future studies as a field, as a discipline, encompasses a fair bit more. It uses the same basic techniques as you've been exploring, but it is aiming at trying to make predictions of the future based upon solid evidence of, that supports those predictions. But more importantly, it's about trying to um, direct society towards a preferred future. So it's not just predicting what the most likely future is, is to occur. It's trying to make predictions as to what futures could possibly occur so that we can then avoid some and move towards others. So as we've seen, it's based on trends. So all of our futures predictions aren't just made up. They're not science fiction. They're not guesses. They're based upon evidence that we can find in, in the data that we can develop trends on and then make extrapolations as predictions. So that is the fundamental nature of all future studies, that it must be based upon some form of evidentiary basis. Now, it can be um, numerical data and so forth. It can also be based upon expert opinion. And we'll be discussing that and exploring that in the next unit. But there are generally some drivers of change. Trends don't just happen for no reason. There are mechanisms in society that cause these trends to occur. Now, they may be individuals, they may be movements, they may be um, societal um, changes. But there will always be some mechanisms that we can identify as what are called drivers of change. Now, these can be positive and negative. Some of them can resist change. Some of them can promote change along various um, trajectories. But a significant aspect of future studies is identifying these drivers of change. Now, of course, sometimes things occur unexpectedly, and we call these wild cards or shocks. Now, the pandemic is a good example. We knew that a pandemic would eventually happen. We've seen pandemics happen previously, worldwide pandemics. So we knew roughly what would occur um, and generally when it would occur. Everyone knew there was some sort of major pandemic would occur in a reasonable amount of time. But we still weren't particularly well prepared for it. It was still a shock to the global system. And there are likewise other shocks um, and wild cards that can occur. A war could occur. A major technological advance can occur. And these can cause what are called discontinuities, which are changes in direction. So with our future studies, we may have all of our predictions set into place and we're seeing things happening and we can make our um, forecasts into the future that things will happen in a particular way. And then something happens that disrupts that and causes things to go on another trajectory and a different future to emerge. Um, in educational technologies, a good example would have been the smartphone. Before the first iPhone was developed, phones were used for making phone calls and for sending short messages, SMSs. That was it. Suddenly, we had a device that had the power of a computer, had full multimedia capabilities to play music and take photographs and video and a whole range of other things. And it disrupted the entire smartphone industry. But it didn't just do that. It also introduced uh, what was called the, the um, online store, the, I, the um, app store. This completely changed and disrupted the entire software industry. Up until that point, we had been converging towards larger and larger suites of software, like the Microsoft Office suite. That was where things were trending and everyone could see those trends happening. There were very few new pieces of software being written because it was very difficult to compete with these very large, massive conglomerations of integrated software. 
suddenly with the App Store, we saw initially hundreds and thousands and millions of small software applications being developed and distributed and marketed globally. And that completely changed the software industry. Currently, we're seeing a trend back towards the more monolithic, larger applications. Um, and so we'll see how that trend progresses. Artificial intelligence may be disrupting that at the moment um, with a new form of development of applications where the user can uh, essentially write their own applications using various artificial intelligence technologies. So that has the potential to disrupt the software industry again in that perspective. So there are various discontinuities and wild cards and shocks that can occur. And a big part of future studies is trying to see these things happen before they happen. Now, I've been involved in looking at artificial intelligence for 20 or so years and how it's going to impact upon education. And we've been seeing it coming for a long time. Um, only two years ago, I was involved in a large international study looking at the impact of artificial intelligence on education. We could see what was called the weak signals, that all of these trends and uh, indicators were that there was going to be a major change as a result of the technology. But even still, very few people would actually listen to that because they couldn't see it happening. They couldn't see the implications necessarily. They could be argued and we could argue that these things were happening, the evidence was there and all the rest. But it still wasn't enough to make people change their practices. Until recently, in terms of um, large language models, it reached a point whereby the technology became readily accessible and had reached a tipping point where anyone could make use of it to make productivity changes. And so it's now had a major impact and it's continuing to have major impacts. But that weak signal was there for a long time for those that could see it happening and could position themselves and um, gain advantage from that knowledge. So there are a whole range of weak signals happening all the time. And a big part of future studies is trying to detect these and incorporate that into our planning and our practices. Um, some others would be uh, personal robots. There's a lot of weak signals that um, within a few more years, probably about a decade, we'll have uh, personal robots that will walk around beside us doing all of our um, manual chores. All the signals are there that that's going to occur. Very hard to convince people that it's going to occur, but when it has, when it does, it'll be revolutionary and everyone will say, wow, that's a whole new wonderful thing. So this happens a lot in future studies. Futurists can see the various trends but are unable to necessarily um, convince others that the impact that they can see happening will occur. But nevertheless, that's what future studies is generally about. So there are four main approaches to future studies. There's the explorative empirical analytical approach, which is essentially collecting lots of data and trend data and making predictions from that data. And you've been doing that as part of your um, trend study or your future study. But combined with that, in your case, has been the normative perspective approach, where you've been asked to write a scenario, make some conjectures about what the future might be like if things happen in a certain way. Um, and that's your scenario writing aspect. Another approach is what's called the communicative projective approach, which essentially it's about trying to convince people through graphs and data and infographics to show that various trends are occurring and um, make a case that uh, these things are likely to occur. And then finally, there's the participative creative approach. Now you're going to be doing this in part in your next portfolio item, your Delphi study, where we gather together experts and we come, try to creatively come up with ideas and explore what might occur and examine the future from that perspective. So a lot of this comes around scenario writing, where we present a 
vision of the future and it has various aspects. So you, it should be framed in some way. Um, is it, are you looking at what's going to happen in a particular country or is it globally? Is it what's going to happen from now until 10,000 years or are you looking at what's going to happen in the next five years? There should be some framing of your study. Then there's your scanning of the data and your development of your trend data. Um, essentially, you collect all of your evidence that you can find around various trends. You then make your forecast based upon these trends, but also looking at um, drivers of change and various uncertainties that exist in the current sort of landscape, where things are uncertain as where, which way things might go. From that, you make your forecasts, um, basically developing your various alternative futures. Um, and then you have what's called your foresight, where you frame what a future might be like if various things come into place. And part of that is your visioning, where you try to envisage the preferred future. So based upon all the different things that might happen, you try to create a vision of what you would like to see happen or what you feel is, would be the most preferred future. And then future studies, futures research is generally not pure research. It does have a social agenda. It's generally about trying to um, argue for and direct change towards a preferred future. So that's an aspect of future studies and scenario planning. Scenario planning can be really useful in identifying weak um, signals and also helping us identify our preferred futures. But it does take a fair bit of time and it, does, it can be quite intensive in terms of um, getting experts together and building up teams to consider developing preferred futures. So think about your scenario, about the mega trends that might be reflected in your scenario, about any technological discontinuities um, or disruptions that might occur, and how these might affect the predictions that you've made in terms of your scenario, and share these on the teams.